Stop Mark, <laughs> we're, hello, we're talking about the future of capitalism. Mark, I hear you're a pretty rich guy. <laughs> <laughs> what an open well, I I I God. Eat out a living from cell phones. <laughs> we're here to, we're so here that to means talk. I'm the only politician, keep your cell phones on even when I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> when it goes off, you hear an so annoying sound. We're going to do something right now, and I'm not done before, we're not going to burn too much time. Stop the clock. We're going to talk about real people, the real economy, and you know, Mark, you and I were talking about how this economy is not working right. I just needed to note you're the richest senator in the U.S. Senate today. Take that tie off. Take it off. <laughs> well, I guess since about the regular Senate, people take this since tie off. the Senate is out, and we didn't Ooh. shut down the government. You that's didn't shut down the government. Yay! Okay. Woo -hoo! That's a pretty that low today. bar. I for... said I'm going to get his tie off, and he says, "Steve, I'm Virginia. I don't take my tie off." <laughs> and I said, "You know, we're going to talk about the real economy. So thank you for taking this, making this modest gesture." Um, we could work on your scarf, Laura. I don't know. <laughs> don't even. Uh, don't okay, enough of that. Take my scarf off. Forget that. Mark, why, why do you think, I mean, just frame this for us for a minute. Um, why do you think that the economic equation we have today is coming undone? What are the zingers, the headlines of this for you? Here's, last year and a half, obviously for all of us, it's been pretty frustrating in town, or for that matter, across the country. Gridlock. My concern is, as a big supporter of Hillary and Tim Kaine, that they will win, that Democrats will take back the Senate. But if we don't change the political narrative, are we really going to get things done? And I fear that the kind of underlying technology shifts, the underlying economic shifts, and candidly, as somebody who's been a business guy longer than a politician, I worry that modern American capitalism is not working for enough people at a fundamental level. And the extreme on the left and the extreme on the right scares the dickens out of me. And I think that is reflected in a, a series of things that I hope we get a chance to talk about, a, a whole focus on short-termism as opposed to long-term value creation. We've seen that in the change in our stock market. I mean, there's never been a time when I've been involved in business when the average 10-year hold of a public stock has gone from eight years to four months, mm -hmm. when companies are spending all their profits, public companies, on stock buybacks and dividends. The economy, I got very interested in the last year or so in the gig economy. Gig economy, on-demand economy, that's cool, it's still small. But a third of our workforce is in some level of contingent status right now. So the whole social contract we set up in the 1930s and 1940s, which was based upon long-term employment, they have none of those social contract benefits. So if you don't have a way that capitalism is working for you, and I think that is the issue of our time as somebody who has been Isn't lucky enough to be the pretty successful isn't and that we've got to make Don it work for everybody isn't that what Donald Trump is saying isn't Donald Trump saying this economy is not working it's not working for you uh, uh, workers <laughs> that, that is we're not, not capitalism yeah. what he has practiced right. okay <laughs> at least in any kind of reasonable reputable form that says you pay your bills you honor your commitments you don't go bankrupt every time and you don't brag about the fact that you don't pay your fair share of taxes mm -hmm. that is not <laughs> that's a not capitalism that's capitalism. gonna create yeah that's not the future you know and I say, I, that not, I say that not as I, a Democrat-Republican, but, but, but there's a chance here to get this right. There's a lot of folks on both sides who want to get this I right. I want to ask Laura why she didn't get this right when uh, oh uh, she was working for Bill Clinton and what was left. I mean, I'm just joking, but we, why didn't you get it? And we'll come in a minute. If you were to be President of the United States, Mark, and you were to change two or three quick things, short form, what would you do to shift the economic incentives in the direction you think they need to go. I'd create a portable benefit system to make sure that the first dollar anybody made anywhere, a part of that attaches to them and travels with them. Mm -hmm. I'd make sure that we change capital gains to incent longer term hold and longer term value creation and I think there are a series of other corporate governance things we can do. And third is I'd realize there's absolutely, I heard Tom Perez, he's a great guy, he and I have you know, wrestled on a lot of issues together. I think it is great what we are doing inside the government on workforce training and apprenticeship programs. But ultimately, if we don't change the incentives so that it makes sense for a business to invest in upskilling and training people who make less than $75,000 a year, and there's no incentive now to get that right, I think we need to change it from a credit to a, 
a, a deduction to a credit that's worth more than a dollar, pay it out over a couple of years, even if the person moves, as long as they get a higher skill and higher pay, the company can still get some benefit. We need a radical, rep, a radical restructuring about how we make some of the incentives back on the labor side and not only on the capital side. And I say that as a proud capitalist. Thank you very much. Laura, I want to ask you, you were National Economic, economic Advisor to Bill Clinton. Yes. And you've played an ongoing role with President Obama, and I think you are, are helping the uh, Clinton team now a bit. You've just heard Mark, and, and I just remember during the first Clinton period, the number of jobs were created that was kind of just-in-time money, just-in-time jobs, you know, everything that was like real trust in tomorrow, so people kind of, right. I mean, that was your era. What went wrong? What did you not see coming down? And do you agree with Mark that if you did these various things, they would be substantial shifts for the ec economy? Well, let me, let me start by agreeing with Mark, because he, he, he knows that, the senator knows that on the, on the, the things he listed, actually, I've been uh, right there. Actually, I started a couple of years ago when, uh, when people were looking at the Thomas Piketty book, there was another very important book that came out called The Second Machine Age. Mm -hmm. The Second Machine Age was capturing the, it, the, the reality that the technology is not only taking out a lot of middle income jobs at a speed faster than we anticipated, but it's also causing this inequality. It's also causing this very rapid rise of the non-standard work arrangement. Mm. Th those things were not, the non-standard work arrangement was not a major factor of growth in the mid-1990s. Right. It was not. So we, did, we didn't see that. You've got to see that now when you're saying <laughs> that is the future of work. That is the future of our society. We designed our entire social benefit structure around the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, where unions and government came together with union pressure right. and push and created a set of policies which really don't fit for an increasing number of workers. And that trend is just continuing. So, so I completely agree with, with the senator on his list of things to do. You know, to say why you miss something, it sounds defensive and, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we, we actually did have a very strong economy during the period of the, of the Clinton 1 and Clinton 2. We had, we used to say, and it was on record, the longest sustained expansion of the U.S. economy in peacetime. That was, that was it. We had the entire income distribution from the lowest 10% to the top 10% growing together. We had them growing together at rates that were not dissimilar. The gap between the uh, growth of earnings and the growth of productivity was Okay, secretary. okay, I get okay. all the data. All right, so oh, but, yeah, but, he doesn't want data because he wants me to be snappy. Yeah, yeah. So the point is that a lot of things became and Back clearer. in those days, facts actually mattered. Oh, <laughs> thanks. So, so I'm gonna, before I jump to Rana, um, I'm done. But, 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 but Laura, you know, to, to play off that Lin-Manuel Miranda Hamilton musical, you were in the room when the room. Bob Reich and uh, uh, Robert was. Rubin were just slugging it out. You and, and President Clinton were there. And, you know, to a certain degree, that was also not only a conversation about investing in workers and whether trade worked and building infrastructure. Sure. I'll put that on the Bob Reich side. And Bob Rubin, <laughs> globalization everywhere, constantly. So the, I guess the question is that, in a way, there was also what, what, what Mark it's, just talked about was short-term versus long-term no, battle back then. Uh, honestly, so, it wasn't. It I, wasn't? I, really, I really don't think what that's fair. Was, First of all, yeah. on this issue of in the, the room, in the room, in the room. <laughs> so I actually just had this conversation the other night uh -huh. with uh, Bob Woodward, his book, The Agenda. He basically has it in the room, and we're struggling over the, you know, these fun, we were not struggling over the future of capitalism. We were struggling over a budget allocation. We were struggling over what percentage of a certain amount of money, given the need to reduce the deficit, would go to infrastructure. Was that an essential struggle over the future of capitalism? No, it was not. I think the kinds of things we're talking about here, which is you're really going to reform the, in the social welfare system because it doesn't fit anymore. Hmm. So there were some important conversations going on in the Clinton administration. There was a first attempt, right. which didn't succeed, to move our health care system forward. We now have a health care reform, which is a step, many steps, in the right direction of the portable right. benefits we need. 
Okay, so it was recognized then that we needed portable benefits. We weren't able to move that forward. So I, I just want to say that it really, there were a recognition of some things, and there was, of course, at that time, uh, a real focus uh, on the need to do it in a fiscally responsible way. Okay. So one of the things that's not done by one of the candidates this time around is to say how any of these things will be paid for. Mm -hmm. These social benefit programs are not inexpensive. They are right. essential. They need to be changed. We have to fund them somehow. So for Got example, it. one view is that, that every single worker, regardless of whether they have a traditional employment contract or not, have to have withholding of Social Security from their income. Right. Have to, because we've got to get the funding going yep. into the social welfare system. Got it. Rana, Faru thank you, F F uh, Faruhar has written a book. How many have you read uh, Makers and Takers? Mm. I have to go up. A couple of them, they're right down here. Right. That's All good. Right. So I want to um, encourage you. It's, it's a great hands. book, Makers and Takers, <laughs> uh, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business. If I may paraphrase in my own terms what you're really writing about the end of days for the U.S. economy, <laughs> right? So I have a solutions chapter yeah, at the end. Uh, you have a solution chapter yeah, yeah. at the end. It's really thin. You've, oh, heard, you've, you've, you've heard Senator Warner. <laughs> you've heard Laura Tyson. Uh, but I mean, in a serious sense, I mean, I yeah. want to get it because what we're really all talking about is a, fu I mean, we're, we're joking, but there's a, there's a fundamental mm. dysfunction, uh, dissonance in the system and real people are, 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 are scrambling every which way. I mean, I always find it interesting if you go out uh, uh, to rural Virginia, rural Maryland, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, you meet real people. This is not any joke or laughing matter. And so I'm just interested, you know, you, you yeah. indict the system. Yeah. And you, you said mm -hmm. that we have financialized gains and we've kind of screwed the real economy and real people. Yes. Am, I, am I wrong? Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, actually that's right. Um, I, you know, my book is all about financialization and there's two factors in that. There's the growth of the financial sector as a percentage of the economy, which has almost tripled over 40 years, um, and the power that that gives one particular industry. So let me just throw out one set of statistics. The financial sector creates 4% of jobs in this country. It takes almost a quarter of all corporate profits. Right? So that creates a kind of a Copernican turn towards this industry. That then creates some of the pressures that Senator Warner was talking about around short-termism. You've got companies uh, and CEOs who are under pressure quarter by quarter to please the markets rather than to you know, invest in R&D, worker training, all of that kind of stuff. But there's also a new dysfunction that has developed over the last 40 years. The financial system isn't doing what it was set up to do, right? So, you know, Adam Smith, father of uh, modern capitalism, imagined a financial system that was a catalyst for business, that was a help meet for business. Um, our deposits would go into banks, banks would lend those out to people that would create businesses and jobs and growth. One of the killer stats in my book, which comes from some really deep academic research um, uh, by a couple of very smart economists, is that today, only 15% of all the money flowing out of the largest U.S. financial institutions is being invested in business, okay? Mm -hmm. The rest of it is about the buying and selling of existing it's, assets. Yeah. This is right. a fundamental shift. So we have, if you think about the, the whole ecosystem of capitalism that we're talking about, and you think about the financial system sitting at the center of it, that's, that's broken. That's so something that's very new. Elizabeth Warren is a hero to you. I think Elizabeth Warren's great. I mean, I think that it's great that she's out there demanding uh, a, a narrative that average people can understand, and that's something that I get at in my book. I think that one thing that happened post-crisis is that there was a narrative that, you know, the experts know all these details, you know, big discussions about tier one capital ratios. I'm not saying that those aren't useful. So, Mark, is Elizabeth Warren a hero to you? Listen, and I work on a lot of stuff. We did a bill recently on derivatives. But, I mean, does what, what she represent represent the kind of capitalism I believe, you want? I believe at the end of the day, You've got to have business incentives that create long-term value. I believe at the end of the day, there are functions for government, but there are functions that business ought to have in terms of particularly investing in low and moderate income people that, that they're just not the right incentives in, in place at this point. Mm -hmm. I do worry, mm -hmm. as somebody who is a pretty successful capitalist, with some of the stats that come out of Rana's book, I do worry about the fact that, you know, 30 years ago, 50% of corporate profits went back into the business, and now 95% are in share yeah. buyback and dividends. Yeah. And the theory that that is just the market's efficient reallocation of capital, I don't fully buy. We've right. never seen that but before. Right. Can I raise one other thing here? Because I, I do think uh, that we need to... I, I want to add the, the, another perspective. It's in addition to 
uh, the lack of investment by the business community. And I want to start by putting it in international context. Investment rates around the world are down from the, what they were prior to the crisis, the great financial crisis. It doesn't matter what kind of financial system you have, business investment is down. The, one of the major reasons, independent of the financial system and the incentives, is the basic incentive for businesses to invest is expected future growth of demand. So mm -hmm. the, a fundamental problem with capitalism, and I think I heard Secretary Perez say this in the, in the form that we now are living it, is that the generation of demand is dependent on the sharing of the benefits more broadly. So as income has become more unequal and has the middle class has actually been undermined in terms they of its spending stuff. power, they can't buy stuff. So now technological revolutions usually, technological revolutions usually lead to productivity gains. Those are usually broadly shared. That leads to an increase in demand and new goods and services. So is it time for so Marx? So and we don't, we, we, I'm just Marx saying. Marx has been trending on Google since what, 2008. Yeah. But what I, what so I, I want to just add the yeah. demand income in a quality aspect to this. It's and, not and just the, they're and additional. I think there's a role, yeah. and here's where I might differ with some in, some in, my, in, in my party. There's a role for government regulation. Yeah. There's a role for government redistribution programs. I'm not sure, though, government that unfortunately still has most of their program in a multi-app world, mm -hmm. government still applies programs in a single, single form. And I don't think a government-only mm -hmm. solution is going to work. No. I do think shifting no. the incentives mm -hmm. around tax, around mm -hmm. credits, frankly, around reinforcing more responsible business behavior. I'm really intrigued with these efforts like Mike Bloomberg, SASB, and right. the B Corp, yeah. and Just Capital, Inclusive Capitalism. I think millennials, I'm betting on mm. millennials that they will vote with their dollars and their lives in wanting to work for more responsible businesses. Because if, if we investors don't have that kind of so real, real quickly, As you know, we're, investors we're, are Laura, doing we're that real, now. We're, okay. real, it, mm -hmm. we're seven and a half years into the Obama administration. Um, and I'm just interested in whether you, or not, particularly after the 0809 financial crisis, when the president had more power to kind of redesign the social contract and help it, was that a fail that uh, the emphasis was significantly on bailing I, out the financial no, I, I, yeah. I will, let me say, yeah. I think the president didn't get all the credit and I think history will treat him. I think yeah. it will actually give uh, the end of the Bush period in terms of the kind of you all hands blame. on deck. No, no, I think this yeah. was yeah. a, yeah. Th there were lots of blame earlier, but we don't have time in the four minutes right. left to relitigate <laughs> that. Mm. But they were trying to, the house is burning down, how do you put out exactly. the flame? Exactly. Right. And the, you Got wouldn't it, have yeah. even had a house. I got nothing against act activist investors had an appropriate role shaking up shaky, sleepy so, companies. You don't want Japan. But when every company now is doing some of the activities that is not a, for long-term right. value creation, and the first thing that you cut in an age of technology is that disposable person. When you just think for a moment, you buy a yeah, piece of equipment, that's an asset. You invest in a human being, that's a cost. So just Mark, from even our fundamental accounting You just gave us three proposals on things you can do. And you know what I dislike about events like this sometimes is a lot of platitudes get thrown out, a lot of great ideas, nobody's held accountable mm. for them. I mean, actually, we're more accountable because we you know, want to do that. But I if you were to rewrite that social contract, look so that five years from now, we've come back and looking back, do you, one, is your plan workable? Is there, is, is there a sense among your colleagues that they would move the, on some of these? There is a lot more yeah. self-awareness in the Senate than I think we get credit that we candidly acknowledge we deserve our 8% approval ratings. Mm. There's a lot of folks in both parties that want to get things done. But we got to change the narrative a little bit. The idea of saying we're going to have a social contract that works for everybody in the 21st century, mm -hmm. is that Democrat or Republican? Mm -hmm. If the idea of saying we want to make capitalism work for all Americans again, which in some ways may mean you have a less need for government in certain places, there's a whole lot of Republicans that would sign up to that. Yeah, they would. And the idea that if we don't change the narrative, with this moment in time, hopefully after this election, and that we're just going to continue along slogging with the existing battles, that is not a good business plan for our country. You know, can I just tell you one yeah, thing, sure. too? I totally agree with that. 
You know, one thing that's been fascinating to me, putting my book out there, I thought I was going to get calls from a lot of Fortune 500 CEOs saying, yay, f somebody's finally sticking up for us, we're under so much pressure from the street. Not no, at all. No. But you know who has been calling? A lot of enlightened financiers, hmm. because they're actually worried about how this is going to affect their portfolios. We are entering a period in which growth might be a lot slower. And by the way, there's a looming pension crisis. And if we think that we've seen populism now, just wait until people realize yeah. they're not going to get 8%. Amen. They may not get 4% in their pension so, funds. So one of the yeah. positives here would be, it, it, if you mentioned it, Seth, that you're mentioning it in terms of who's calling you. There really is a growing pool of money out there interested in this kind of investment. So basically, uh, you have a growth of mutual funds and assets where investors are going to and saying, what's the environmental return? What's the social return? How does the governance work? What's the fairness of pay? What's the, what's the metric of good performance long term? And the long termism and the environmental, social, and governance are really one and the same thing. I mean, Larry Fink, it, among other things. Long-termism doesn't mean yeah. you've got to okay. be the Japanese no, economy. No, right. So the, the point is, right now, something like one out of every six dollars under professional money management in the United States is going into environmental, sustainable, and governance. And why is it? Because there's a growing pool of investors who want to do that. And that's why. And there's a growing pool of investors who want to associate themselves with B Corps and mm. consumers. And I, I've met with a, a bunch of B Corps the other day, and I said, why do you do this? Why do you take this on? This is a, a risky new form of organization. They say because it attracts consumers and it attracts investors. So the good news here is maybe we don't even have to mandate some of this. We, no, we change sure. no, the incentives. We, we yeah. change yeah. the incentives. Yeah. Right. We change the structures a little bit. And I think there's a growing pool of investors, and you've heard from them, yeah. who actually want the financial system to behave differently. And yeah. that will put pressure on the companies to behave differently because it's their source of finance. And, but Steve, it starts with a different narrative and a new right. coalition. Right. If, if, you know, Hillary wins, we may get infrastructure done. We may start on international tax reform, but it, there ought to be some understanding. I say this is a pro-trade guy. We've got to acknowledge the pro-trade guy. Trade has benefited normally yeah. major metropolitan areas. It's totally it's hosed a lot of rural exactly, communities. Yes. And we have done an awful job, a awful job helping those communities that have been left behind. Mm -hmm. So there ought to be a deal that says, if you're going to be a beneficiary from trade, at least your supply chain jobs ought to be some of those communities that have been left so behind. So we're, we're right at the end, and mm -hmm. I want to thank um, the three mm -hmm. of you. And, and just before you started, Mark, when you opened with uh, this notion that if, if, if Tim Kaine and Hillary Clinton come into office and come in, it would be a real travesty if this weren't done. Do you have a worry that your own team, the people leading your own ticket, don't get it? No, I think they no. get it. But I think it's it. going to take, candidly at this point, a bipartisan group of folks, yeah. mm. hopefully to. coming out of where I work, have to. that's willing to step up and say, mm. we're in on a new frame on about how we address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Because if we simply change some of the players and relitigate what has been litigated for the last seven or eight years, we could be back again where what, what the biggest applause line is, we didn't shut down the government, and the country's too good for that. <laughs> right. Thank you, Laura Tyson, Rana Faruhar, and Senator Mark we Warner. Kept the Thank government you